one. And here we are. Welcome back to the Richard Solver Podcast, where we never sit out. We're your hosts, MD and CD. CD, what is going on? What is going on? It is week 11. We are previewing week 11. Conference races are tight. Tight. Sphincters are tight at this point in the year. How are you feeling about this week? I mean, as a Minnesota fan, it's pretty tight up there in the Big West, yeah, Big Ten West. I mean, it always is come November. But guess what? Today's Maction night. It's Wednesday night. We're recording this. We'll post this on Thursday. We love it. We we saw three just classic Mac games. Okay, Toledo takeaways. Really impressed with. Really impressed with Daquan Finn. Four hundred yards today. I didn't think he had it in him. He did. Holy crap! Didn't even need the ground game at Penny Boone. Penny Boone got his through the air, but not to the ground. Bowling Green. Continues to impress, okay? But I'll say this about Kent State and Kenny Burns. They fight. They fight hard, okay? They're a couple years away from actually competing in the MAC. We knew that was going to be a long rebuild. It has been. They have the resources there. At Kent State, they have the resources to it, compete it's pretty, a good, quick, pretty quickly. It's a, good, it's a good MAC spot, for sure. And then Miami, Ohio, without their quarterback, just without the fight, the fighting Blank Gabberts, without Blank Whoa. Gabberts. Forgetting Akron didn't have DJ Irons either. I so, understand that. The battle of the but, backups, but yeah, their defense looks really good. Really good, really, really good, and yeah, the the Mac is shaping up to be a pretty good con. Sounds like a two way race right now, um, yeah, but Toledo, Toledo's right behind. Toledo's, right behind. Toledo has wrapped up uh, their trip to the Mac championship, and then uh, Miami Ohio. If they win next week, then they clinch uh, a second shot at Toledo, and that was a close game. It was a closer game than people think, because uh, that was when Ble- uh, Brett Gabbert went down. So I think a yeah. full week of a game plan with uh, Smith in there. Now, not that Smith is impressed at all, because he's not. But your your game plan changes drastically with him at quarterback rather than Brett Gap. It's hard to beat a being uh, wow. It's hard to beat a team twice, right? We know that in college football. Anyways, if you look on the screen right now, these are the games we're going to be previewing. There is eight of them, plus four There's more eight. upset meters today. You think it's a sleepy weekend? No, it's not. There's a lot of yes, Michigan, Penn State highlighter. There's a ton of good football. A ton of good football. We'll try to do our best to give you the best that we can do for for week eleven here. Any last thoughts before we head into this? Uh, well, look if you like the content, like the video, right? And of course, if you guys want to keep sticking around, checking out our content, uh, we're posting every week, twice a week, recaps, previews. Monday, Tuesday is when the recaps come out. Previews come out every Thursday morning. Uh, we'd appreciate a subscription. We just hit hundred subscribers, so thank you guys so much. That was awesome. I literally woke up this morning as we're recording this and we hit a hundred subscribers, which is awesome. Did not imagine the channel growing this fast, but uh, that's thanks to you guys for smashing that subscribe button. So appreciate you guys. Uh, you know, comment, of course, if you disagree with us comment, if you have injury reports, we love to hear those in the comments. Sometimes we miss things because guess what? The injury report in college football is just impossible. It is impossible. If you're not so inside information, uh, I'm over here sniping on, like three different websites trying to figure stuff out. I just want to know if Jared Guess is playing. I want to know if Sam McCall is playing or Grace McCall is playing. I, I, I want to know. I want to know. Sam McCall, come on. No. Sorry, not Sam McCall. Well, that's a guy who's guy also stinks. on the injury. Oh, he's old. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, Gra- Grace McCall him. does not deserve to be in the same sense as him. No. But, uh, <laughs> Anyways, oh my God. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's get into it. Let's talk Michigan, Penn State. Right off the bat, the headliner of the week, Michigan, a team that seemingly has played no one, or is that just because they've dominated everyone that they've played? Uh, Penn State has been in the gutters a couple games, tough game against Indiana a couple weeks ago, passing game struggled. But guess what? Uh, Amidst all this Michigan sign-stealing scandal, can Penn State steal a win at home against Michigan? The line is four and a half here in favor of Michigan. CD, I'm going to let you take this one first. Here's the deal. It, like you said, you mentioned it. Michigan's played nobody. They have not been tested. Penn State also has played nobody outside of Ohio State where they looked awful. That score ended up being, I guess, a little closer. That game was not competitive. No, yes, they did have you know the big strip sack or whatever that, that changed the whole game um, that was called back, return for a touchdown. But, yeah, Drew Allard did not look good in his first start. But? Benefits here. He comes back home. I do think they match up a little bit better with Michigan than they did last time. I think they're going to try to establish the run. 
They finally got K. Allen going last week against Maryland, albeit Maryland. It's not Michigan. Maryland is not even the Maryland that we know in September. Yeah. But nonetheless, it was impressive. Okay. They beat up on teams they should have beaten up on. And that's kind of been James Franklin's hallmark, right? Like he has won games he should win. And when they are dogs, they tend to lose those games. That doesn't mean he's a bad coach. That doesn't mean that he can never beat those bad teams. It's just, or beat those good teams. It's just, it's what the state of the program is right now. Although I am going to say like, on that note, I just think Michigan's a wagon right now. I do think Penn State has a couple things going for them dynamics wise. I think the NCAA <laughs> and and like the powers that be, TV execs, whatever else, have kind of screwed Penn State. Number one, why is this game not prime time? Right, I understand. We, we know why. Big Come games. on, we we know. I understand why. Big Ten, Big Noon kickoff. I don't care. This game should be a whiteout game. Then I would be terrified to death. I think if I'm Michigan, I'll be picking Penn State automatically. Whatever. Second thing going against Penn State right now, dynamics wise, is that whole story you mentioned at the beginning. Everyone knows in college football the sign stealings, counter stealings, whatever, whatever. Everyone has their opinions. I'm not going to give you mine today, but I will say like that can galvanize the locker room. You, you Penn, Michigan needs something to be up to be extra gear motivation, extra thing. They they, they doubt us. We cannot win with sign stealing, whatever, whatever. Like. That that sucks for Penn State. I think they're running into they're 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 running on oncoming traffic right now. Just a, a bulldozer just coming right at them. And I think they're gonna be on the wrong end of a whooping here. I'm gonna go Michigan to cover and obviously to win. Yeah, I had someone ask me, so I, I did Michigan was one of my national championship picks. Got them at plus ten fifty at the beginning of the year. Actually, I said beginning of the year, I meant back in April. Uh or sorry, not April. It was like probably June. Doesn't matter. Someone told me, "Are you worried about that?" Because now Michigan will not have signs going forward. Like you just said, I'm not worried at all. This team passes the eye test. It has looked the best, like the best team in the country. Total yard, total offense, and total defense. They look pretty similar, like eerily similar to Penn State, right? Offensively, they're 50th in rushing in total yards, 45th in passing total yards. Penn State, they're 43rd in total rushing yards and offense, 76th in pass offense. Uh, so pretty similar there, but that does not tell a story, right? Now, both these teams have not run the ball like we thought they were gonna, going to at the start of the season. But the reason why Michigan is only has forty is only 45th in total yards uh, offensively passing the ball, it is because they're getting short fields and they're getting up on teams. <laughs> so they don't they don't need to throw the ball late in the game. They're averaging 10 yards per attempt. That is fifth in the country. At 75 completion percentage for J.J. McCarthy. Yeah. So whereas like you look at Penn State, 6.4 yards per attempt. That is 100th in the country. That is two completely different passing attacks, right? The other thing about Michigan too, they're healthy. They're completely healthy. Penn State, Chop Robinson, questionable. Edmund Vorner, uh, Van Over, sorry. Uh, both questionable. Now, Van Over, that's more of a depth piece there. But Chop Robinson, if he doesn't play, that's a big deal. Big deal. Uh, people are also saying, like, oh, Michigan's offensive line, it'll be really interesting when they play a really good defensive line. They've played some good defensive lines. We saw Penn State when they played a really good defensive line, and it did not look good. And Michigan's defensive line is very good. Michigan is also the least penalized team in the country. Only 2.7 penalties per game. Wow. Discipline. So four and a half is a tough uh, number to get at, that, right? I, of course, for our picks purposes, right, I'll take the minus four and a half. But if you're talking betting terms, right, Michigan is averaging the most points uh, in the third quarter in, in the entire country, right? If you get a chance to live bet this at under three, you're going to do that. Because early in the game, right, we might see Michigan get punched in the mouth for the first time against a really, really physical team. And I'd be like, oh, whoa, whoa, Penn State kind of came to play. Like last year, remember that? They had, a, they had that long touchdown, the scamper by uh, Sean Clifford, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, Penn State's in. I live bet that immediately, and they absolutely floored them. Uh, on the other hand, though, you could argue that, oh, Penn State is the most fourth quarter points in the country. That is because James Franklin does not quit. He is always he trying to cover, to the, cover spread. the spread. He, he is always trying to cover the spread. the spread. Well, his reasoning is, and I actually agree with it to it, to a certain degree, right? You, you, any player that's on the field, you should give them an equal opportunity to earn playing time as well, right? That's 100%. 100%. 
And uh, I, I do agree with that to a certain extent. There are levels to that, of course. Uh, not every situation is uh, quite even, but I, I just think Michigan's a much better team. Look, Penn State, we, we were both high on them. We both took over nine and a half wins this year. Uh, and they could go 10 and 2, which I would expect them to after this game. But uh, this Michigan team is just, in my opinion, playing the best football in the country right now. I don't care. Look, their schedule looks a little bit better than you thought it was going to be. I mean, Rutgers, that's an okay team. UNLV, that's an okay team. <laughs> so, Bowling Green, all of a sudden, yep. Michigan a bowl, schedule. Bowl Bowling Green, by the way. Yeah. A Bowling Green team that had three interceptions against J.J. McCarthy. People seem to forget. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, yeah, give me Michigan uh, for all the same reasons that you said as well. I will say, like, yeah, like, to add on to this Michigan talk, like, it's literally Noah's Ark over there, right? They have two of everything, okay? Two running backs, two wide receivers, two tight ends, two tackles. Two of everything on defense. You can add even three linebackers. Like they're they're unbelievably deep. Like they do not have a hole on their roster. We talked about it in the summer. That's why we love this Michigan team. They were deep. They don't have holes. And like JJ McCarthy gives them this dimension this year that he's playing at, and that we talked about him. That we were hoping he was going to take that step, and he has. Where they don't have to rely on a running game and defense to win a football game, to win a big time college football game. They don't. They can do it with the arm and, honestly, the legs of J.J. McCarthy. We've seen them this year. Haven't really used his legs because they haven't needed to. Don't want to get them hurt. I get that. But also, like, you've seen in big-time games, they love to use that dual threat ability to give them that extra edge, especially if they're having trouble running the ball against those. It's a really good front, a really good front for Penn State. Three great linebackers. If you're struggling running the ball with Corum and Donovan Edwards, like, a nice pull every now and then. Somehow, it, it's kind of been weird that they haven't been able to dominate on the ground game. And Blake Corm's gotten his, but Donovan, it, I don't know what's happened, dude. That's the thing. The, the thing that worries me about Penn State is their O-line has not lived up to the hype that it had. I think we've realized that this is not an elite O-line that we're thinking. Their guard play, their interior play is really concerning. And Michigan has some dogs in the middle. Dogs in the middle. Even without Mozzie Smith, that was the concern. It was like, wow, okay, we lose Mozzie Smith. That's a big deal. It they is have not some matter. dogs in the middle there. They're really, really good. And you saw Michael Hall. You saw guys on Ohio State really get to Penn State from the interior. And they've got guys to do it as well. I will say path to Penn State winning. How do you see that happening? Penn State can win That's this game. It's a four and a half point spread. Explosive plays. How do they win? Early and often, absolutely. Like, like Michigan has given up. They're averaging giving up one red zone possession a game, right? So if you're not getting to the red zone, right, you got to score somehow not being in the red zone. Get those explosive plays, right? Get those explosive plays. I think their average touchdown that they're giving up is like 40 yards. Um, yeah. We're looking at trick plays. I mean, weird. Like, everyone's pulling out all of their bag on Michigan. Except Minnesota. Minnesota scored a nice one. They they had a goal yep. ball to Daniel Jackson. And he made a nice play. Ethan threw a nice ball. The thing, that point's exactly it, though. Like, you cannot go 8 to 10 10. You get 10 plays on them, 75 yards, and methodically drive it down the field, especially with Penn State. Penn State's not built to do that. Michigan's built to stop that. I agree. I want to shout out Dante Cephas real quick. Been talking about him all year. In the oh, summer, he was oh, my guy. He, he finally, finally got out. finally got a touchdown. Here it comes. It'd be nice to have another guy. And we talked about two of everything. We talked about Noah's Ark from Michigan. Penn State, they got two running backs. They got two tight ends. That second wide receiver would be super nice for Drew Alar because, yes, everyone gave him crap in that Ohio State game. There was not open receivers. There was not. And now I think part of that is due to a really, really good Ohio State defense. Michigan's defense, no slouch either. Will Johnson, the boys back there, really good. Find ways to be creative if you're Penn State's offensively. You've got to get scheme open receivers. Easy reason to Drew Alar. Get the ball out quick. Get them comfortable going. Take shots deep. Be aggressive in this game. You're the underdog. That's what it's got to be. Let's talk SEC. Let's talk Ole Miss at Georgia. Georgia. Minus 10 and a half. It's a lot of points. Uh, Ole Miss only has one loss on the year. And that loss was to Alabama. An Alabama team that is surging right now. Um, and Georgia's played some close games this year, but it seems like even without Brock Bowers, this offense with Carson Beck at the helm is able to get it done. 15 for Heisman. Maybe. <laughs> 15 for Heisman. 
He's up there. He's up there. Uh, a credit Ole Miss last week. They played Texas A&M and Jackson Dart. I mean, just threw the ball around the yard. It made DJ Durkin look like a Mac defensive coordinator. Not that I'm sorry. The Mac did not deserve that. They did not deserve that. Yeah. But guess what? It was bad. And it was say missing CSL corners. North. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was missing a bunch of corners. I still don't believe that this Ole Miss defense is all that good. I, I think this might be a route, dude. Ole Miss on the road. Like it, it's crazy to say, like, I think a lot of people have this on their upset alert. I don't see it. I, I kind of see George running away with this one. Like last week was the week of the dogs. It was the week of the dogs. This week might be the other way around for me. I, I really like George in this spot. I like them at home. You hear Brock Bowers was running at practice. Doesn't surprise me one bit. That guy's a superhuman. And it, yeah, and, and he, he anybody, won't play this game. He won't play this game. Anybody who thought that he was going to sit out the rest of the year, I said, no, I didn't want to say it out loud, but I said, no way. Like, that guy's different. That guy's built different. He wants to come back in three P. Yeah, he is. It's three weeks after tightrope surgery. That guy's already practicing. He will not play in this game, but those are the kind of dogs that the Bulldogs have, right? Yeah, give me Big G. Give me Carson Beck. An improving run game, and ever getting like a defense that is seems like it's congealing more and understanding their roles and people finally are healthy and it's, it just seems to be coming together for Georgia right now and uh well granted this part of their schedule is a little bit has been a little bit tough uh they've handled it I was impressed in the Missouri game I've been impressed by what Ole Miss has done this year like these past couple weeks but overall Ole Miss is gettable we saw Tulane, who has a pretty good defensive front, just shut down Ole Miss. Just shut him. Yeah. I know Trey Harris. I don't know if he – actually, I don't think he was playing in that game. No, they, they were banked up in that game a lot. They were banked I mean, up in that game. But so was Tulane. Michael Pratt, Michael so Pratt was and, Tulane. and others there. I get that. And, and Ole Miss should be deeper. But they, they're getting healthy now. They're peaking right now. I think they're playing really well. Yeah, key to the game for them is turnovers. Find a way to get turnovers. And Lane Kiffin's just going to have to be magical. Right. It just makes it so much tougher that's on the road. And like Sanford team, like have they had like aside from the Missouri game last week, like like they've been kind of itching for the big games. This is a top ten matchup. This is a top ten matchup. Ole Miss there's some, ten college football power ring or college football rankings, well, right? So there's some urgency in Sanford Stadium. I think in Georgia. I I think they know like they want a minute, but the, this is not the Georgia team of past. And and they could still run the table, they can still go fifteen or no. Whatever. Every year is different. You cannot be comparing. It's hard to compare past teams because, like, every year is different in college football. But I do think I like them on paper. I just I love the spot here for Georgia. I I love the team on paper against each other. The dynamics of the schedule is just it's really weird. It's the that third game, right? You had Florida, you had Missouri, and now you got Ole Miss. It's hard to get up for three straight games in college football. I know if any team can do it, it's Georgia. It's Kirby Smart. But these are like, this is a new cast of Georgia. I, I get it. They sat there and learned, but it's different. And this is them now for a third straight game, having to get up and play really good football from the jump. I do think in terms of like actual, you know, on the field, I think Jackson Dart. You mentioned Carson Beck for Heisman, and while I, I support that, I love that, Jackson Dart has a real chance to play himself in the Heisman, com- Heisman opportunity. If he wins this game, sure. Like I, I think going okay. to going to New York. I, I, the problem is here is yes, Ole Miss is nine and one, and like or eight and one. I'm sorry. It just it sucks because like Alabama is right there with no conference losses and the tiebreaker. So like they've pretty much clinched their spot, which is a shame. As long as they beat either Kentucky or or Auburn, which you know you you think that's going to happen, but yeah, I, I just do think like. Running quarterbacks sometimes give Georgia problems. I think if they can get some tempo going and some Quinshawn junk is going early, I think they have a chance in this game. The receivers can win one-on-one opportunities. And I get it, like, last year, and, like, the Georgia secondary is incredible. It's incredible. It's ridiculous. Like, it's as good as it is every year. It's probably better this year than it has been in the past. The past this front seven was just ridiculous. This year, that front seven is good, but that secondary is incredible. So, like... That's the hard part. I think Trey Harris, Watkins, Wade, Creek scoring, hopefully, can find matchup for him. Like, there's 
matchups to be had here for Ole Miss. But that being said, you still have to stop Georgia, right? You still have to stop Georgia. Are you taking the plus 10? Are you taking 10 and a half? Uh, let me check what the over here is, what they're saying. Because if it's 58 and a half, right, quick maths here, it's going to be what? 20, it's going to be 34 to 24. So, yeah. like, I, I do think Ole Miss scores more than 24 points. So I'm going to take wow. Ole Miss. Okay. I'm not regretting. But Georgia to win. Yep. I've been, I've been, oh, I've been over when we're picking Georgia games, except the Kentucky game, but that was free. I run it. That, we, we knew that one. That was free. But like the past couple we weeks, we were all over that. I've been just on the wrong side of Georgia covering. But this time, I think I'm right. I think Ole Miss is going to give them their best shot. And I think Georgia's tired. Like, I think it helps that this game's at home. It really does. But also, like, if you're Georgia, I know, like, you, with the way it is right now, like it's hard to lose a game and still win. I think your schedule will be strong enough by the end of the year that you can be 12 and one and still get in. This is not the game you have to win. It's next week. Tennessee, if Tennessee beats Missouri, that game next week, you have to win as long as um as long as you win this game here. But as long as you don't win this game here. But regardless, I, I did think this is a spot. Ole Miss tests them. Georgia comes out at the end. So I'll go Ole Miss to cover and Georgia to win. Arizona at Colorado. Colorado getting 10 and a half in the hook. Why are we talking about this game, CD? Well, you guys love it. So, people who are watching this video, we're covering this game because of you guys. You guys have enjoyed our Arizona content and our Colorado content. And we love it. Uh, we Once again, at the beginning of the year, we said that this is the year of the Pac-12. We're going to be covering a lot of Pac-12 football. Uh, you know what? This is a big game because... Arizona has a real chance to potentially compete to get a spot in the New Year's Six. If they went out, there's a non-zero chance that they could go out get a bid for a New Year's Six Bowl. This game means something for sure. I couldn't agree more. I do think if you want to give out like awards for like, you know, Pac-12 awards, like the first half probably goes to Colorado, you know, for the big story, Dion story, whatever. But Arizona, man, you cannot deny what they have accomplished right in, in October and, and more specifically in November, which I think they will continue to do in the rest of November. I think they're really, really good right now. Fafita on the road, I don't care. Give me Arizona and the points. 11 and a half is way too low. And and I get it. Colorado's fun. Shador Sanders at home. You know, they're going to put up points. I just don't think so. I think this Arizona defense is legit. I, I really do. Arizona has been it a wagon is. here. Arizona has been a wagon, eight and one covering the spread right now. We love that. That's going to continue today. They're going to go nine and one against the spread, seven and three overall. And for Judd Fish and those boys, they're going to continue to play well. And I love it. I love it. Yeah. Jetty Fish over there is, he's, they've caught fire. And you know who hasn't caught fire? Uh, Colorado's offense. Could that be yeah, in part? of the fact that they decided to not let Sean Lewis call plays anymore. Yeah, that was, uh, that was unfounded. Is that like, yeah. is that a very basic take of us? No, it is not. Sean Lewis is a big deal when he's calling plays. We saw it just in one game. We saw it. It was abysmal. They were abysmal. What They, they didn't cross 100 yards, total yards, until the third quarter. Brutal. And that offense we know is capable of a lot. We've seen it time and time again. Now against some of the more elite defenses, right? Oregon, they struggled. But uh but Kawa can put up points. And Shador Sanders has been playing very, very good quarterback this year. So it is a shame that Sean Lewis is not calling plays and putting this team in the best position to win. So for that, like that is the biggest reason that I am taking Arizona and the points. Ten and a half, eleven and a half, twelve and a half, thirteen and a half. Okay. Now is there about an eighty percent chance there's a backdoor cover in this game? Oh yeah, totally. That's why you love Arizona, it. That's why you love it at ten and a half, though. Yeah, Arizona will win this game. They will. And your Arizona fans, I asked you after the recap. Hey, what do you guys? What do you think this score of this game is? A lot of you guys said thirty-five seventeen. I think that's a good score. I think it could be even worse. I think it could be like I think it could be forty-five. I think it could be forty-five twenty-one. I think it could be forty-five. 14. I, I think it could be like that, right? Like, so Arizona, like, 
what do you think this score is going to be? Right. And, and Colorado fans, why do you have optimism? Right. Like, I, and I want to hear from a Colorado fan that I want to hear someone defend. Like, is there are there Colorado fans out there that are that can defend the decision to not have John Lewis call plays? If you are out there and watching this video, let us know in the comments. I would love to hear the rationale. Uh, because maybe I'm not an X's and O's guy, right? But I I know I know personnel and I, and I know that he's a guy. So I, it'd be very interesting to hear that. It'd be very very it, interesting to hear that. It was a big deal when they hired him from Kent State, right? Like he didn't get fired. He, he went over and I'll, he was head coach. I'll, was demoted to offense coordinator of Colorado. That was a big deal. He brought over some guys there, their offensive linemen, whatever, whatever. And it looked like the great hire for three weeks there. And then obviously, you know, poop at the fan here. But I, in my opinion, I think it's Dan Sanders just trying to send a message, do something, throw a bunch of dark, you know, wet pieces, wet paper towels at the at the wall and hope something sticks there. I do think like the, the over-under is at 54 and a half, right? Like, Pretty low line, I think, with the caliber of defense Colorado plays and the caliber caliber of offense that Arizona can play and that Colorado can play at times. I do think, like, if you're Colorado here, you got to at least try to commit to running the ball. When they made that change last week, I was like, okay, maybe they're going to try to run the ball. I get it. Your O line is banged up and bad. I get that. You have to at least try though. They Create did not the numbers. Try. Get creative with it. Screen game. RPO, do something to lighten the box and give you a plus number in there. Shador Sanders, run Wildcat. I don't care, but at least have them respect it. And yes, Arizona's defense, their D-line's fantastic. Um, so which is why I also have pretty high confidence that Arizona's going to get the dub here, even on the road. They've just been a wagon. They've just been a wagon. Fafita, as soon as he came in, has just been incredible. Just been incredible the rest of the way though for them they got utah and arizona state that utah game i that's gonna be a really good game i two really good coaches in my opinion right cal whittingham jeff fish it's gonna be really exciting as for colorado like they need this game here they really do the urgency there they're like they're looking at bowl eligibility if they win this game here they're staring down below a chance at bowl eligibility and i think that would be really exciting for Deion Sanders in Colorado. I think they know that. I think they know they have a chance. Regardless of nonetheless, it's still been impressive what they've done. Don't let the right the, the one in five, you know, last six games really affect you or cloud your judgment. This is like this was a this is a bad roster that was plugged by transfer portal rejects and they're making it work. So they'll get there eventually. That's your turn right now. It is Judd Fisher's turn. And I think these two teams will be doing a lot coming Jed to Big 12. Fish. Jed Fish is such a Sorry, stud, man. dude. He's such a stud. Let's talk more Pac-12, though. Let's go to Seattle. Utah visiting Washington. Utah catching nine and a half. Wow. I, I think the power ratings have – I thought this line going to be a little bit higher. I think the power ratings have cooled down on Washington a little bit. And I and I wonder if there's a little bit of overreaction to last week with Utah just beating the crap out of Arizona State. I wonder if there's a little bit of that. God, dude, this line's pretty low. And I'm not saying I'm gonna take, pick Utah, Washington either way. I, I'm just gonna let you know. Like, I think it's it surprised me, but I'll let you go. Uh, Utah's offense the last couple of weeks has done well against poor defenses. I would not classify Washington's defense as poor, right? And that's why that's why this makes this tough, right? I don't think they're in that top echelon, right? In the Pac-12, right? That that upper echelon, right, is is of course Utah and uh, UCLA. I don't know if I in Oregon and or of course Oregon, duh. I don't know that I put Washington in that echelon. I don't know that I put him in that tier. Michael Penix, of course, has been playing out of his mind the last couple of weeks. Uh, minus the Arizona State game, but there there was, there was a lot of flu going on there. It, it was it was a weird week. Yeah. Late night Pac twelve. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just I, I feel really weird about this game. I feel really weird, and when I feel weird about games, I'm gonna stick with what I know, and I'm gonna take Utah to cover the nine and a half. But not just that. 
give me Utah as a nine and a half point dog to win straight up uh in Seattle. Yeah, yeah, you you heard wow. it here. You heard it here. I don't know. It's just I just I'm predicting just a weird, weird game. Okay. Now, is that the right pick? It probably is not the right pick to take Utah straight up in this game. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about this though. It's always the right pick to take them to cover. It's never the the wrong pick to not fade Kyle Whittingham, if that made sense. Yeah, I so I'm I just I'm gonna do it. I I feel like people aren't talking about this game enough, which is exactly why people should be talking about this game. You know, that's always when Utah is dangerous. I I will say here, like people forget. I think everyone just has made up in their mind with how poor Washington has has looked. Right, since that Oregon game and like how good Oregon's looked since, like everyone just expects, oh, they're gonna rematch and Oregon's gonna beat them neutral side and they're gonna go to the playoffs. People forget like Washington's undefeated. They're nine and zero right now. They're still like very much in the thick of college football playoff implications. And I think Seattle Washington's gonna be buzzing. I think Michael Penix and the seniors on that team that came back for a reason. This was the game, and these are the types of games that they were supposed to win and that they wanted to win. Husky Stadium is going to be electric. They're going to run the ball, right? They find, they got them going last week. Had a great game on the we'll ground. We'll see if they can run the ball on Utah. Uh, and you don't have to, like, okay, you don't have to go, you know, 26 carries, 256 yards, four touchdowns. You don't have to do that. But you have to at least try. Give Roma Dunze s- some chances of being able to get open and get going. Polk as well is McMillan still hurt right yeah it's been it's been weird in because he's like played a couple snaps in a couple games and then I don't know I, I haven't have not been following that injury because I have not been able to figure it out at all yeah so, let, let us know if you be back in know. the comments there let us know if you have any information on that I, I I've been trying to find stuff and it's it's kind of weird but regardless I think Polk and, and Washington the, fans help or, us out Utah Polk fans and- I know that Kyle Whittingham keeps him the cards close to the hand or cards close to the the, the chest. So I that's a, that's gonna be a mystery. But Washington fans, let, let us know. I, I would love to know the injury status of Jalen McMillan. Uh, of course, as we're recording this uh, Wednesday, uh, so this come out Thursday morning. Yeah, let us know. I mean, I would it influence my pick a ton? Probably not. I mean, you still got Jalen Polk and. Uh, Run things like. so I'm not, and, and I guess it looks like they found a run game. I don't know. I I feel like this is just this this is a letdown spot for both these teams. I think they're both coming off absolute barn burners where Utah played great game offensively against an absolutely horrendously beat up Arizona State who resorted to the four string quarterback. They're missing like five offensive linemen, and of course Washington played USC, whose defense, I mean, got more holes than Swiss cheese. I mean, so I. I will say a left-down spot for both these teams, but give me the better coach. You heard it here. Kyle Whittingham, better coach than Kalen DeBoer. Yup. That's not that's not a hot take. It, and, like, I get if you're a Kalen DeBoer truther, like, that's fine. I'm a huge fan of his. Kyle Whittingham's the, the class of the Pac-12 right now. Like, like he is. Dan Lanning, would I hire him to run an elite-level program more than Kyle Whittingham? Probably. But, like, Kyle Whittingham's a dog and should never be untrusted. I will say, though, with that being said, I'm going to take Washington and the points. I do think it helps being at home. I do think they're motivated. Not that Utah won't be, and Utah would love to crush their dreams, would love to. But Washington's going to be highly motivated to win this football game. And Washington, the thing that scares me is they are in the meats and potatoes of their schedule. We circled this back half of the year for them. The month of November was going to be brutal. Started with USC on the road, Utah at home, at Oregon State next week, and then finishing off with... Washington State, right? And Washington State's just been dramatically worse than we thought they were going to be, especially after the hot start. But regardless, it's a huge rivalry game. This is really interesting here for Washington's. I do think this is, I wouldn't call it a must win game. I think there are scenarios where they can lose this game and still make the Council of Playoffs. But I think this this roster, these seniors, they understand the magnitude of this game and the urgency that they're going to play with. And I think they will. I mean, you hope so, right? But maybe Bryson Barnes legacy game. Come on, come on, Bryson, Bryson Barnes. Barnes. I just really want to see, oh, man. I 
I love Utah. I, I hope they win this game. Let's talk Tennessee at Missouri. I was shocked by this line. Missouri catching a point and a half at home. Right? This is at home. They're they're at home. Am I wrong? Yeah. You know, they are. Uh, so, and when I watch Tennessee, the eye test tells me that this is not a very good football team. I'm sorry. It's not. And when I watch Missouri, the eye test tells me this team's all right. Now, before we get on our horses about picking things, right? Luther Burden is questionable, which is a giant yeah. deal. Brady Cook, I uh, believe he's going to play, but he was on the injury report. He'll I think be fine. They said that he's going to play. He'll be all right. If Luther Burden is not playing, that is a gigantic deal, and it does impact. It, I think it would completely impact my pick. Right. He's been gigantic on that offense, explosive now. Theoise has also been very good as a number two. Uh, Cody Schrader's been very good on the ground as well. Uh, yeah. But come on, dude. Like, this Tennessee, I, I still can't get in my head that this Tennessee team is that good, right? Will they be able to run the ball on Missouri? Maybe. But I believe uh, their left tackle is pretty banged up. I don't, I don't know that he's going to play. And I think that's a big deal in the run game. So give me Missouri. Give me give me the one and a half. Give, give me the one straight up at home. Like, give me what I think is a better team at home catching points. Now yeah. there is the, uh, oh, hey, we're coming off just playing Georgia. The old banged up, you know, like the, the theory in the NFL where like every team that played the 49ers last year, like the week after they lost or whatever, like the, the whole banged up theory. I mean, beat you twice. No, these are some absolutely durable. Well, except for Luther Burden, I guess, and Brady Cook. These guys, they're rubber. They're going to bounce back. Give me the Tigers. I love that you got the word durable in the in the video here. Regardless, so I do think this is a fantastic game. Very intriguing. Top 15 matchup. It's probably for, like, like this is for bragging rights for second place in the SEC East. I, I think if you're Missouri here, you're trying to make a statement like, hey, like, we're for real. This is not going to be like September fever where everyone catches, you know, Missouri. They're, they're hot. They've beaten Kansas State and whatnot. No, no Missouri wants to make a statement here that, hey, we're going to finish 10 and 2 and we're going to be second in the SEC East. And so when we expand and invite Texas and Oklahoma next year, like Missouri is a real team to be trifled with. Tennessee, on the other hand, they're trying to prove that last year was not the fluke. That was not the exception, that that's the norm. I do think I mentioned September fever. I do think this is. Two of the most misconceptions quarterbacks. Is that the I don't think I said that right? Two quarterbacks that are misunderstood, mis misevaluated because of their Septembers. I do think Joe Milton was highly overrated coming into the year. Right. And he was gonna have bumps in the road as a first year starter, as a real first year starter in this offense. And it happened. And he slowly progressed. I thought he played great against Bama. I thought he played really well against Bama. A really, really good for two quarters. Yeah, but that defense is incredible. We saw J- Jane Daniels last three quarters. Like, like you, you see, like this this defense is really, really good, especially at home. It was on the road. It's another road test for him. I think Milton is getting better. I think Brady Cook is getting worse. With that being said, I do think everything you said holds up. I do think Missouri is actually a really good football team. The eye test tells me Missouri belongs on the field with, with Georgia. My eye test tells me that Tennessee – should not be seven and two, and their loss against Florida was super ugly as well. I get it; that was weird. It was in the swamp. Your old line was banged up. Whatever. I do think Missouri is just it's just a good football team. Eli Drinkwich can scheme guys open. I do think Tennessee's defense is good. I think they'll do their best to stop Schrader and put it on Brady Cook. I do think as long as Luther Burden plays, I think Missouri covers, and obviously they do win um, as well. One and a half, I might as well take them to win. But yeah, I'm gonna agree with you there. I do think like Joe Milton, it would not shock me if he plays a fantastic game and starts living up to that build that we kind of build a build him up to be right then in uh back in August. But yeah, this is a fantastic game. Fantastic yeah. game. And I will say for people that are like, well, I don't know, like, oh, 
Tennessee's going to control the game because they can run the ball better. Uh, newsflash: Cody Schrader leads the SEC in rushing yards. And they, they got he got on the ground against Georgia. Like they ran the ball well against Georgia. Yeah. yeah. On so, the road, Georgia. That Tennessee defensive line better pony up again, and uh, let's see what they're made of. I mean, because because Florida kind of gashed them. I mean that that was really in the season, but Florida gashed them. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I will, I will say disclaimer here. You know, saving my own butt. But if Luther Burden cannot play, that really changes this football game. I know it's hard to put a point value on a wide receiver like that, but like he's so dynamic. That offense with Eli Drinkwich. With the slot receiver, they just do so much with that that it's so hard to replace a guy like that midseason, especially with a guy that's obviously not as dynamic as Luther Burden is. And yeah, but if anyone can do it, it's Eli Drinkwich. I mean, they just continue to produce there. If you're a wide receiver, <clears throat> with, <laughs> yeah, Ryan Ryan Wingo, Ryan Wingo, you should be going. You should be thinking about Missouri, man. They're really fun offense. Eli Drinkwich does his thing. <laughs> oh, I can't believe we did that. But yeah, I think um, regardless, so as long as Blue Burden is playing, I'm taking Missouri to win. And and by the way, my Tennessee under will officially cash. Well, if it doesn't cash this week, it will cash next week. Well, that's what I'm saying. We love it. Rutgers at Iowa. This is the lowest total in the history of NCAA football. As long as live odds have been out and around, what is it at now? Are you looking at? It? Yeah, it's it's down to tw- it's. I think it's still at twenty eight. Let, let me let me let me double check and see if it if it changed. And, and like Rutgers, offensively, they're not great, right? Defensively, this is a legit Big Ten defense, by the way, that Rutgers has over there, and they've done enough offensively with Gavin Wimsatt and his athleticism and running the ball. <laughs> With running done, the ball, running the ball, running the ball. They've done enough with his athleticism. He isn't really throwing the ball that well, but yeah, Mananga. Oh yeah, I mean he he's he's the next Pacheco man. Pacheco is incredible there. He he runs yeah. the ball hard. Well, Pacheco didn't even like, start on that Rutgers team, which is criminal. Uh, NFL scouts understood they 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 understood the assignment. So, uh, see the Chiefs. So Iowa team stinks, dude. It stinks. That that football game last last week was a disservice. And normally, as a Big Ten guy, as a defensive football player, like I love, I love defensive games. I love, you know, grind it out. Let's let's punt on fourth down. It's fourth and one. Let's punt the ball. Let's play field position. Iowa is just so incredibly frustrating to watch because like they're uber conservative. It always works out for them, except I guess in the case of Minnesota. No big deal. But like they just they just beat teams that they should beat. And like teams that are not a tier or two above them, they just they just it's hard to beat them. It really, really is. But that being said, I'll give me Rutgers here. G- give me Rutgers and the under. Rutgers is gonna win this thing 23 to 3. I think wow. they're gonna three points. I really do. I think I was gonna turn the ball over. I think Rutgers is is a really good defense. You saw what they did to Ohio State, and now Ohio State's no incredible offense. But like, I think Rutgers is legit. I think they're really, really legit, and they're gonna go on the road here, and and that's gonna this game right here is gonna turn the Big Ten West into even more chaos, even more chaos. And how? Yeah, we saw Brian the Brian Ferentz firing or whatever that they did. It didn't matter. Didn't change anything. Like. We know that we know exactly who this Iowa team is. Don't kid yourself. Don't overthink it. Take the under first of all, <laughs> and take Rutgers. I I struggle with this game a lot because the formula for Iowa winning is Gavin Wimsett not being good, right? That's the yeah. formula, and I. I've seen plenty of that this year. The, the, I've seen wins, plenty of that. In wins of Rutgers, like that's part of their formula too. Like, oh, we know our quarterback's bad. Not bad. We know his limitations. Yeah, yeah it's throwing the football. Still a young guy. I'm still gonna keep hope for him. But like it his limit, like yeah. 
Yeah. Also, I love this picture of Deacon Hill. If if you're listening on Spotify and not watching this on YouTube, this picture of Deacon Hill is awesome. (laughs) That guy's had enough. (laughs) That guy said the. Wait, wait. what are you talking about? That guy, Thick Vic, (laughs) Thick Vic over there is running around bird life, and he is slinging the rock with zero care as to where it lands. Oh my gosh. That guy, that I, I forget. There's a funny name that someone had for him. I, I just call him Thick Vic because he is so gigantically large. Oh my God. Dude, and the thing is, he's a sitting duck back there. He is a sitting duck. Rutgers just blitz the crap out of him. Just puts the yeah. crap out of him. And don't do not lose the special teams battle. Do not turn the ball over. And well, his thing by ten points, like. Last year's Rutgers team, I actually would have liked a lot because their punter was elite. Yeah. I would have actually liked that. Uh, What sucks for me, though, is I'm like, how do I pick against Iowa at home, right? Well, I'm going to do it. I'm riding with you, Rutgers, plus one and a half. I, oh, this Iowa team just stinks, dude. Like, I can't. Oh, I'm just, I can't do it. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're covering this game, though, because – I like talking about, I like talking about the underbelly of college football. <laughs> Come on, okay. It, <laughs> it, is the under, it is the underbelly of college football. This oh is the lowest God. total in NCAA history. What does that tell you? It tells you you got two good defenses and two pretty abysmal offenses, but one of those offenses is so abysmal. What I, I'm. I want to know what the Iowa team total or the the team total is at. I don't have it in front of me, but inherently, if it's one half, their team totals, it must be like fourteen. Yeah, it must be fourteen. If it's fourteen and a half, oh, I might consider taking the under. It's one of those triple unit type plays. You think you're so funny? The underbelly of college football. Come on now. Anyways, yeah. I mean, that <laughs> Deacon Hills got a little oh. belly there going. If you're a Rutgers or Iowa fan, you came here for some analysis. We did our I best. love the thing is I love I love Rutgers. I love Rutgers. Oh yeah. We we are. We, they they could win. You took their over this year. I did. And I shouldn't have I shouldn't have even all lined it. Like <laughs> yeah, you all lined to win. Three for like a they have chance to win eight, one. 180. They have a chance to win eight games. <laughs> Should have all lined it in the other direction. No, literally. They they could win eight games this year. And that would be awesome. Just awesome for Rutgers. They can recruit well. Like they, they have a chance. Greg Shannon there. Well, New Jersey's they have, talented. They have the ability to find some some star players, keep them home, and they've done that a little bit. And then you just you hit on some transfer portal guys, and you can build up to a year where you can go nine and three, right? And you can, I mean, obviously once they change the divisions, you have a, honestly a much better chance of doing whatever. But yeah, I just think it's tough. Stuff, but I do. I do think Iowa. We know who these teams are. Like, if you came here for analysis, you came here for in-depth things. Like, we both know exactly who these teams are. This might be the most. And everyone connected. who's listening to this also knows what these teams are. That, that's what I'm saying. When I like say you we viewers, you listeners, guys well. you guys know just as much as we do about these teams. We've all seen them. If you don't think though, I'm going to be turning on the Big Ten Network at 2:30 Central on Saturday, November 11th, Veterans Day. Thank you, soldiers. I will. I will be watching this game. I can't it, wait. Absolutely. This is a classic game. And it has, we talked about a little bit earlier, it's got real implications. Real implications on the standings because you've well, got to go for, as you as a gopher person. fan, I mean, you, it's a big deal. Selfishly, I mean, I always root against Iowa, but Rutgers, like, th- this is huge for a Minnesota fan, for a Wisconsin fan, for a Nebraska fan, and even Illinois. They're still in it somehow. Like, yeah, they've got a real chance. Like I- Iowa has, does not have this thing wrapped up by any stretch of the imagination. Especially if they lose this week and like some things happen, like it's it could be like a three or four way tie. What's that? I have a compliment for Iowa. Remember we talked about them wanting using Cooper DeGene on offense. Well, they did, but it was like what was it like three plays that they had him like run jet sweep or whatever. Do what you can to get that guy on offense. Anything you can to get that guy on offense. That guy need. Touches, that guy just simulate touches. a punt return somehow. 
Yeah, just, just yeah. Give him the ball and just give him a lot of space. Uh, let's see if I can get the stats. Yeah, Cooper DeGene. Oh, I guess he only had one touch on a jet sweep. He needs more than that. Come on. He Look needs more it. than that. that I can't. Get that picture off the screen. I can't look at Deacon. <laughs> Deacon Hill is so awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. Please like this video. Though, if you're yes. listening, like this video. Like it for just, like for, like it for thick pick down there. Like it for thick pick. He deserves that. I would love actually, I would hate it, but I think it would be hysterical if he comes out 24 for 28, 313, three touchdowns, three nothing. Three oh. zero interceptions. Wouldn't that be just incredible? And all of a sudden, he's a hot name on the transfer market. Like, so, nope, that's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. We love you, Thick Vic. Keep working. Let's go to the Sun Belt. Texas State at Coastal Carolina. Did this someone some say people- gigantic oh. Sun Belt East implications? I mean, we're looking at. Oh, you're back. You just froze yeah, out there yeah. for a second. Gigantic Sun Belt implications here. Coastal Carolina, despite not having Grayson McCall for however long, is playing good football. Playing good football. So that is a picture of Jared Guest, if you're watching on YouTube uh, right now. There's a chance that he does not play on Saturday. Now he didn't play this past Saturday. And what do we know? What do we know about Big E? Big Ethan, that kid, he's a good athlete. Coming from Virginia, he was a really, really good athlete. It's kind of a homecoming party for him. Uh, playing old, at Old Dominion, I thought he played well in the second half because I don't, I don't think the coaching staff knew that Jared Guest was going to be out that game. I don't think that they knew. So, Ethan Vasco got the start. Didn't look good in the first half. And then in the last 14 minutes of that game, he looked like a dude. Uh, If you know anything about Ethan Vasco, he's from Virginia, uh, committed to Kansas, which you know immediately if Lance Leipold wanted him my quarterback, it's probably a good thing. He's and I'd want him, yeah. Yeah, 6'3", 180, incredibly athletic. He actually has a pretty good arm, too, from what I saw in that game. And uh, – I think he has the the Virginia high school record of 10 touchdowns in a game. Uh, So he's a redshirt freshman. That was his first career start. Awesome. Awesome work from him to come back in that game. Old Dominion down 21-6, finding a way. Because he's got weapons out there, right? Pick me, right? CJ Beasley. I mean, he's got talent. Jared Brown. I don't don't know. I I think Jared Brown's going to be injured. I don't know if he's going to come back for this game. Uh, Regardless, he's still got weapons. So either way, like I – even if Jared Guest plays, I don't see a I can see a scenario where both of these quarterbacks get work in this. Game. I think Vasco brings something to the offense that's I'm not gonna say it's been missing, but like it's a nice element. It's a well, really well, that, nice that, that two point conversion play that where Jared Guest is like he went in at quarterback. So I don't know why he was out. Right, I think he was ailment is what they said. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Uh, gets a snap, hands it off to Vasco, who was playing running back for them. I mean, it's so awesome. So I, I, like, when I first looked at this line, I was, I was really like, I had trouble picturing. I'm like, why is Texas State only a one and a half point favorite? TJ Finley's been awesome. Body once again, one of the best running backs in the entire country at this point. Uh, that zero people are talking about. Zero yeah. people are talking about. A great wide receiver core. Uh, I mean. I don't know. So I, but then I kept looking at Coastal Carolina. Their defense has been playing better these last four games. They're on a four game tear right now, and they get this guy, these guys at home. So Coastal is going to be that. That place is going to be pretty rowdy, if you ask me. The place is going to be pretty rowdy. Yeah, th- this is a really interesting game. Like, there's a reason we're covering this game. I do think TJ Finley, what we saw last week against Georgia Southern, super impressive. Good to see him get back to like playing a really good quarterback. Like he, he started the year off really hot and kind of got a little bit cold in, in the middle there. And, and now he's playing really good football. Obviously you mentioned like the running backs there. Like, like it's a good, it's a very good roster as for the like this, this game matters here for coastal Carolina. Obviously we, we 
we assume that James Madison is not going to be playing in the time belt championship. Obviously, they appealed this week. They're hoping to get that reversed. Um, because if they can make a bowl game, then they're eligible for the Sun Belt Championship game, which would be an awesome game against um presumably Troy. But but Coast Carolina right now is atop the east on the Sun Belt and looking to get revenge here. Um, yeah, that that this team, no matter the quarterback, it's just been plug and chug. And it started out a little slow for them, but they're they're fine, they're kicking in the gear. And obviously that blue turf, right? That's awesome. It's awesome there. Oh, it's hard to do it, man. It's hard to do it. Give me Vasco. Give me Vasco. Wow. One and a half. I'll take it. I don't care. I'll take him in the win if that's the case. Like, I just think something special about that, the way he comes in, it just it adds, like I mentioned, another element to this team. Deep throw with Pickney. Got some guys over the middle. Vasco. I, I just love it. I love it for Coastal. Yeah, I – I mean, I like Coastal in the spot. I mean, they're a hot football team right now. They're a very yep. hot football team. And Texas State's defense has been very vulnerable. So if if there's a, a game, like, he, here is my thing, though, right? Texas State has a full game of film now on Vasco, right? They can prepare both him. And Jarek Guest is a pretty good quarterback, too, in his own right, right? You know, yep. he's, he's a veteran. And he played really, really well against Marshall. Granted, Marshall's... They are on the stink alert. They are stinky, stinky, stinky. But, yeah, I do really like those quarterbacks. What's crazy is that the third-string quarterback for Coastal Carolina is very good at, at quarterback. He's very good, which not a lot of schools can say it all. Like, would you take Vasco's as your backup quarterback at Minnesota right now over Cole Crane? Yes, in a heartbeat. I'd take him as my – I'd think about him for starter. And I like it. I like it. I... After one game? No, I mean, it's I, I can understand the frustration. This is a pro Vasco show. It is, it is. But it's also a pro Bobcat show. Give me the Bobcats. I will fade you. Give me minus one and a half. I think the Texas State team, granted, Troy's just got to win this week, and then they lock up that West. Coastal Carolina – also has a tough game against Army after this. They have a tough game against James Madison. Like, it's going to be tough sledding for Coastal Carolina to win the Sun Belt East. I know they're atop it right now because they're 4-2 and two versus Georgia Southern's 3-2, and two, but Georgia Southern owns a tiebreaker there. So, I know that they've they been playing it. a lot better, but if, if they get off to a slow start like they did against Old Dominion, right, which, by the way, shout-out Jason Henderson. 22 total tackles in that game. Stud. Stud. And he's the only guy on that old Dominion defense that is worth a damn. Okay. And I do think Texas State's defense is vulnerable, but what they do have is creating negative plays. And you have a freshman quarterback in there, right? And and you're not able to run the ball effectively, and you get a freshman quarterback in some third and long situations. Granted, very, very athletic. Very, very athletic. Ethan Vasco. I do think it could cause problems. Uh, so give me Texas State, give me the one and a half. So I, I, I do like your pick. Like, I don't hate your pick at all. I mean, if this was if this was in San Marcos at Texas State, right? I would, it would be a no brainer. I think it'd be no brainer. But on the road at Coastal Carolina, it's, it's not a game. It's not a game. But Texas State has played well on the road this year, and they went to Waco, beat Baylor. Right. Uh, I have the schedule pulled up right here. They went on the road and put up 30 points on Louisiana. Lost late. Kind of blew that game, but, like, they should have won that game. Uh, they dominated Southern Miss. They put up a 50-burger on them. So, I mean, they were in a ball game with UTSA, who, by the way, is one of the favorites to win the American right now. So, I on the road, it, it hasn't rattled them, I don't think. So, just, yeah, give me, give me the quarterback that I, that I know what I'm getting with in TJ Finley and Madi. Once again, is a stud, Hobart, Hawkins, great receivers. Uh, couldn't find anything on any injury reports on either of these teams besides the quarterback position for Coastal Carolina. So if you guys have anything, oh, well, Jerry Brown, I guess, for Coastal, but let, let me know in the comments. Oh, well, I want I want to know, like, fans of Texas State and Coastal Carolina, what do you think the score is going to be? Like, like, are you confident in this game? Like, as a Texas State, a Texas State Bobcat fan, right? Are you confident going into Coastal Carolina and getting this win? 
And, and Coastal Carolina fans, like, yeah, it was a great win against Old Dominion, but if you don't get off to a good start, are you confident that you can win? You know, like against the Texas State team, like it's a good Texas State team. It is. Right, dude, can you keep it going? It's a question. Can you keep it going? Player shot, player spotlight of the night, though. Joey Hobart, you mentioned him before, man. That guy's a stud. As soon as I stepped in the Sun Belt play, he's been incredible. 100 yards a game except everybody, against everybody except Troy. Right, All 5'11", 180 of him. He is awesome. If you're a Sun Belt fan, you will know who he is. If you're not, I really urge you to watch out for number 10 right in, in Maroon there. That, that, that's be, he's a good player. That's a really good player. Well, yeah, and another good player on the other side, right, Jared Brown, which, which I talked about. I mean – which is why I think it's a big deal if he's not playing in this game because that gives Vasco another weapon that he can use, right, uh, <clears throat> to win this game. Right? Jerry Brown, 41 catches, 552 yards, three touchdowns on the year. Now, Sam Pickney is a freak at 6'4", right? He is a specimen. There's not a lot of Sunbelt players like him, right? All those guys are playing Power 5 football, right? But but he's going to be he's gonna be drawing attention and probably double cover. You, you have. Have to, you have to put help over the top on him. That's why you love a guy like Jared Brown. Yeah. You can well, go. well, CJ Beasley mm-hmm. stepped up last game. Like, I think they have some guys, but Jared Brown is very, very good. I think a lot of Coastal Carolina players would argue that he is the most explosive player on that team. Mm-hmm. So I, it, it hurts if, if, if he's questionable or he's not playing, like that, that hurts. So I, I, for me, quarterback uncertainty, Jared Brown questionable. Give me Texas State. Whoa, bet you didn't think we were talking about the C-U-S-A today. New Mexico State at Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky minus four and a half. Why is this a big game, you're asking? Well, if you're a fan of either of these teams, you know exactly why this is a gigantic game. We're talking about Conference USA championship implications. Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Christopher, Jacksonville State cannot play in the C-U-S-A championship. Criminal. No, they cannot. As successful as Rich Rod and them have been, criminal. They cannot. So Liberty is pretty much locked up their their bid. Uh, you know, it's the first year in the CUSA. It's not their first year in FBS, so they are eligible for uh, conference championship. This is a really interesting game, man. This is really. Interesting. I think like after the UMass loss, people rode off Diego Pavia. People rode off the Aggies. But guess Me what? Included. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a that, guy that was on awesome. Dawson's that was Diner. Awesome. Having New Mexico State on Dawson's Diner that game was abysmal to watch. I, I do think people, you're right, people did check out. You, you watched Week Zero game like that, and it was tough to watch. You see just a bad UMass team kind of kind of destroy this Jerry Kill led, the fighting Jerry Kills in New Mexico State. And they played, they've come a long way. They're playing good football right now, right? And they got a real chance to make conference championship. And, like, that would be – Uber impressive. Uber, They're Uber impressive. number one in the country in yards per carry. 5.9 yards per carry for the New Mexico State Aggies. Uh, like I said, first in the country. Here's the thing, though. They only run it about 55% of the time, which is a lot, right? Uh, but it's not like a ton, right? Like I, I thought, like when I saw that, like 5.9 yards per carry, I'm like, well, they, I get. I mean, when I watched them, I guess – they did run the ball a lot, but I I didn't I didn't expect I, I expected that number to be higher, right? So, uh, Western Kentucky is the opposite. They they throw the ball. Uh, in fact, they throw the ball what sixty two percent of the time, which is good for fourth in the country. So, kind of battle the opposites right here. Both teams going to try to control the game here. What's interesting about Western Kentucky is like people were very high on them, and the granted they've had a very very tough schedule this year. Yep, very tough schedule. One that includes Ohio State. One that included, uh, of course, Liberty, right? But they just Austin Reed just something doesn't look right there. Malachi Corley like isn't playing at the you know level that we kind of expected him to play at this year. Still a very very talented player. Uh, I do think this Western Kentucky team is a lot more talented than this New Mexico State team. But uh, 129th in a. Uh, Sorry, I have it written down here. 129th defensively in total rush yards allowed per game. So I it's hard. It's hard, hard, hard for me to take Western Kentucky minus four and a half. I don't know. What what, what are you thinking? What are you thinking here? 
It is hard. It is hard. Pavla, I, I love Pavla. If you watch him play, if you're not familiar with Cusa and New Mexico State, he is just a grinder. He is awesome. Short little dude, runs around, just plays with awesome energy. Right. Since they've entered conference play, they, they've been playing really, really well. They're five and one conference, right? They lost to Liberty Liberty, right? And that now New Mexico State outside of Liberty probably has the worst schedule in college football. Now they do play yeah. here coming up. And so obviously that, that'll add to your strength of schedule, but they haven't played yet. So they have two conference games left and they're trying to lock up right up the spot in the, the, the conference championship game and a rematch with Liberty. You're right. It is hard. I, th- I think Western Kentucky, everyone just saw, okay, Austin Reed returns, one of the best group of five quarterbacks returns. Malachi Corley decided not to go the pro or not to go test the, the transport of waters. And everyone's like, oh, just plug and chug. Like, they're going to be elite offensively, and, like, they're just going to be dominating the CUSA. And they're they're missing a lot of guys. Ben Arbuckle, right off the coordinator at Washington. We see the impact he's yeah. had on Cameron Ward. Right, obviously you miss him, and then for four weeks you lost the whole. Okay, there's a lot of holes in that team. Ben Arbuckle has been a, a, a promise, and has been an, a, a bright spot on that team. Regardless, though, watch Western Kentucky. It takes a lot more than quarterback and wide receiver to win a football game, and they're finding that out the hard way. There, I think fans are. I, I think college media is like it was just a foregone conclusion that Western Kentucky was going to be, you know, dominating the Cusa of them in Liberty, but like. It's not been the case. Obviously, they did play a tough schedule. They also played Troy out of conference, which is awesome. That's a really interesting, like, G5 to G5 out of conference matchup. And yeah. After New Mexico State, they're like, they win this game. Like, they're putting themselves in the driver's seat. So when they play up the two worst teams in the queue, so Florida, FIU, and, and Sam Houston State. Yeah. Right? Plus, like, New they, Mexico they, State's got to play Jacksonville State. If New Mexico State wins this, though, I think they pretty much lock it up, right? They, they do. As long as Jacksonville State continues to be I haven't heard anything about them, but like you know, with with in the Sunbelt James Madison, as as long as they don't get that same waiver that, that James Madison is hoping to get, like yeah, it, it will be New Mexico State and Jerry Kill, which is just awesome. Just awesome. Um yeah, I'm gonna go I'm actually gonna go in New Mexico State here on the road. I think they get it done. I do think that mid mid Tennessee State that score is misleading. I thought they played well in that game. I think they bounced back. And they get a nice win against Western Kentucky on the road as dogs. Give me Jerry Kill. Yeah, I'm riding with you. I mean, their defense by no means like very bend but don't break it, right? 61st in yards per uh, attempt allowed passing wides. Um, 72nd in passing yards allowed per game. Their run defense is not much better than that. They're only 70th in terms. They're average, 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 average on defense. And they have not played all that talented of teams, including talented offenses. But again, like we said, something's wrong with that offense in Western Kentucky. Jared Kill or Jerry Kill loves dialing it up on defense. Yep. I, yeah, yeah. If you're going to give me four and a half, I'll take it. And I, I do think that there's a good shot that New Mexico State wins this game. So I'll, I'll take them to win straight up as well. I, it, it's so. When I watch Western Kentucky this year, they, they don't look that good. They do not look that good. So that that's why, so I'm going to take it. Now, even even their passing offense for how much they pass it, they're 36 the pass yards per game, on the season. Not really pushing the ball down the field like they should be. Defensively, they've been just abysmal. So, now granted, Western Kentucky's been there, done that. They've been tested this year. It's some pretty good teams. New Mexico State, on the other hand, has not really played a tough schedule. I do think they just kind of do enough. Now, what would hurt New Mexico State? A uh, Diego Pavia slinger pick, right? That right between the numbers of a Western Kentucky hilltopper, right? That that'll that'll do it. Which you can be prone to doing that. But I think yeah. if they stick to the ground game, if they stick to the ground game, I think they can leg this one out. I think they can control the game, keep Western Kentucky's offense out of sync, off the field, out of rhythm. I think they can do it, man, which would be awesome. I didn't think we were going to – week 11, we were going to be previewing New Mexico State at Western Kentucky. And I also did not think at the beginning of the season that I'd be taking New Mexico State straight up against these Hilltops. <laughs> It, real quick, do you have um 
quarterback breakdown here. Who would you take and why? Who, who's the better quarterback? Or who's going to play better? Who's in the better spot to play? Oh, Pavela. That's a tough question. Austin Reed. I mean, Pavia is not going to pay play. Like he's not. He's not that good, right? Austin Reed. We've seen it from. But so on the like, ground though, Pavela gets it done on the ground. Yes, yes, he does, and that's part of that offense too. And it feels like they discovered that a little. Well, they did it a little bit last year, but I think they've really kind of committed more to that uh, role as the season's gone on, uh, running the ball effectively, especially with Pavia. I just, I think Austin Reed is the better quarterback, and normally I'm prone to taking a better quarterback, right? I'm, I'm prone to doing taking a better quarterback at home. But I feel like I, I feel like I have to take New Mexico State here. I just, I just kind of feel it, man. I just kind of feel it. Did you know, by the way, if you haven't heard the story, this is incredible. This is the kind of guy Diego Pavela is. You know, he got accused of of urinating on rival New Mexico Lobos <laughs> logo. <laughs> I actually did hear about that. That was one of those week one things that I remembered hearing about. When he was mm. losing, getting his teeth kicked in by UMass week one, um, and that was just like, oh, I remember that because it was like it was week zero. Oh, sorry, it wasn't week one. It was week zero, and yeah. you know everyone's trying to like everyone's hungry for that college football story, right? So that was like the story that week, you know. So I don't. That is pretty hilarious though. So maybe he gets it done. Maybe maybe he lets these hilltoppers have it. Whoa, we're an upset meter. We're an upset meter. Five out of 24 of these teams have gone on to lose. And why is that impressive? Because what are the rules for upset meter, CD? Well, you have to be a 10-point or more favorite. We go in and we get surgical and we pick out games. We identify games that we think, you know, maybe could be interesting. Come second half, right? You can be sweating out. Or maybe it's like, you know, we're not worried at all. And so we pick up these four teams. These are four favorites on the screen right now. If this is on Spotify, I'm sorry. But if you're on YouTube, see that the nice graphic. It's Oklahoma, Clemson, South Alabama, and Liberty, respectively. And we will go through and tell you how we're feeling about them. Yeah, and uh, look, our average spread for these games is about 13 points. So uh, the odds will tell you that that's about – the team will have an about an eighty six percent chance of winning that game, right? Which leaves our underdogs a fourteen percent chance of winning. So the fact that we're picking at about twenty two, twenty three percent, I like it. I think we're doing okay here. I think we're doing okay. But yeah, the four teams featured, like you said, Oklahoma, Clemson, South Alabama, Liberty. And what is the scale we use? Cold, mild, sweating, steaming, piping. Pretty self explanatory. Pretty self explanatory. Uh. The hottest being piping, meaning, yeah, it's going to happen. Cold meaning, yeah, it's not going to happen. We have not had a piping this year, for the record. These are all 10-point spreads. I mean, it's got to be a, a game to have piping. But our steaming team last week, Washington State, Cardinal, Big one guy. of two teams with a 10-point favorite, or one of two favorites with a 10-point spread that lost last week. We had them in steaming. So uh, I think we've been doing a pretty decent job with this. Of course, if you throw enough rocks at a, at a barn, you're going to hit it, right? Uh but I have fun with this. I, I like this segment. I like it. it gives us a chance to talk about some more games too. Maybe some under the radar ones, some games that are more under the radar because of how big the spread is. But yeah, uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, who's playing Oklahoma host, playing? Playing host to West Virginia, the Fighting West Garrett Greens, Virginia. man. Huh? West Virginia. Neil you were Brown. telling me before the season that Garrett Riley or Sorry, I forget Riley. <laughs> Garrett Green is uh, playing like one of the better quarterbacks in the Big 12. I would have said, you're absurd. I would have said, you're absurd. Oklahoma, kind of on the decline right now. Now, granted, West Virginia's secondary, very exposable. What do we say about last week, Oklahoma State? That secondary is also very exposable. Kansas, Kansas's defense, their secondary, very exposable. So back to back weeks, we had a tough time exposing the secondary. Even against Texas, Dylan Gabriel relied on his legs to win that game. 
I kind of I don't hate West Virginia in the spot to pull off an upset against Oklahoma. I really I mean, don't. I do think Garrett Green. I'll get the other side here. I think Garrett Green and Donaldson they can they can move the football. They can move the football. Yeah. On Oklahoma, I really do. I thought I was really impressed with them last week. Just just handling BYU from the jump. Didn't even matter. Didn't even let them have a chance. Devin Carter's coming on strong. Garrett Green, we said, was continuing to play well. Kobe the Taylor's there as well. The O line. Oh, they got they got two running backs. They really like White and Donaldson. Like Gallagher, the freshman, gets involved as well. This is a good team. This is not the West Virginia of the past couple of years. This is not your average Neil Brown's West Virginia. This I have, is I have I have this in sweating. This yeah. is sweating for me. Without a doubt. And and I think Oklahoma, you know, they're I wouldn't call them in wounded animal mode. Like they're kind of they're done. Their hopes of winning it kind of it's kind of done. It's not over. Actually, it's not over. I should not say it's over. It's not over. But I do think they're they're pretty upset. And and obviously, like they can react one of two ways. I assume they'll they'll play pretty well. I don't think they're gonna just mail it in. Like that doesn't happen really in college football. Like these guys get four years to play football for the schools they love and like they're gonna do it to the best of their abilities. I do think it helps. They're coming back home after a road stint that was not good to them at Kansas, Oklahoma State. It does help. But I do think, like, West Virginia, man, they're good. They're, they're just a good football team. They've got really good losses, by the way. And and Penn State, Oklahoma State, it was a buzzsaw right now. And then at Houston with the Hail Mary, like, that was just weird all around. It's like a Friday night game or Thursday night game. Like, it, it was just tough. But, Dana Holgerson, job saver. Yeah. Regardless, though, I think West Virginia comes to play here. I, I, I'm not going to pick them straight up, but I do think, like, yeah, sweating is exactly what it is. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, let's talk about Clemson next. Uh, who's Clemson playing? Only the most confusing team in college football right now. <laughs> Only the – they're – Clemson plays Georgia Tech, for the record. At yeah, home. I'm sorry. I should have made that. At yes. home. But, but Georgia Tech, they – they are so confusing because they will play absolutely abysmal and they will lose to Bowling Green and come out the next week and beat a top twenty five Miami team. And then they, they will, go, they're like, and they're like, oh wait, we're not done. Let's go beat North Carolina, right? I mean, who was also on this upset meter uh, that week? So Georgia Tech, they could lose by forty, but you have to put them on this meter because they could, they could pull off this upset. So that's why I have this one like in mild. Actually, I have it like low mild. Like low mile because I think Clemson kind of got right there after Notre Dame. I think they're like physical enough to where like they kind of handle this Georgia Tech team. Uh, I don't think Miami played physical enough against Georgia Tech. Well, Miami should have won that game. I mean, realistically, right? Uh, I do think North Carolina did not play physical enough. I, I think this is a more physical team that I think will give Georgia Tech problems. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do think so. I was really impressed with Clemson last week. Obviously, Georgia Tech was also impressive in their own right and like. Beating a team, finally beating a team that they should have beaten in, in Virginia. I say that jokingly, but like you said, it's been a roller coaster of a year there, especially for Hain, Haynes King. Like, I will say, like, there's been more ups and downs. I've been pleasantly surprised with how well he's worked out there with Brent Keen's staff. I do think Eric Singleton Jr., like the freshman, he's done well. Dominic Balak, like, like there's some guys there. Christian Leary, some speed there. Like, they, this is an explosive offense, and they put up numbers against teams. I do think Clemson's got a really good defense. I do think like teams and like situations that hurt Clemson, like namely like fourth down and goal line, like turnover opportunities. I do think like Georgia Tech's not the team to expose that in them, if that makes sense. And I, I that's why yeah, I I agree. I will say I will ask you this though here. Who do you take quarterback? Hayes King or Kate Klubnik? That's a fantastic question because I've never been on the Cade Klubnik train. And in that in that quarterback class, I think it's very clear who the best quarterback in that class was. Uh, and it's not Cade Klubnik. And we thought Garrett Riley might, you know, bring out the, now granted, Antonio Williams, Bo Collins, are these number one receivers at a lot of other schools? No. If you had brought in some transfers to help out Cade Klubnik, I could see Cade like like he makes Pretty special plays at times. You can kind of see it. But this is a team that has relied heavily on their ground game the last two years with K-Club being a quarterback. Uh, 
And I, I do think like this Clemson team, if they do like, is it crazy to think that if DJU was here with Garrett Riley, that Clemson would have more wins than they do? No, I, I don't think it's crazy. I, I don't think it's the reason. I, I wouldn't I think point you can make the argument. Nick. I think you can make the argument for sure. Uh, I'm not gonna say, oh, if this then that. Like I'm not gonna play that game, but it that definitely seems like you know one player's playing significantly better since he's left Clemson, and then the other one's still uh, struggling at times. Like, yes, yeah, I, I will say. That, with that being said, it this is a this is a low mild for me for sure. Yeah, real real quick to add an injury report there because like in, with lines and upsets, like injuries sometimes matter in these games. Will Shipley, we were a little surprised he didn't show up against um Notre Dame last week. He has the concussion still. He's been practicing. He's trending up right now. Dabo Sweeney thinks he will play. Antonio Williams is getting better, but probably will be out again. R.J. Mickens, same thing. He's close, but might be out. That's another. It's a beat up secondary. With Sheridan Jones and Jalen Phillips both out, right? Like if you're Hayes King, you have a chance here to make some plays. But like we said, like we believe this is at home. Clemson gets right here. Yeah, again, I think so too. South Alabama. Uh, Carter Bradley like to not play in this game. Gio Lopez. You know what I like about Gio Lopez? Everything. Everything. <laughs> that guy just screams Sunbelt quarterback, and I love it. He's mobile. He's agile, mobile, and hostile. Lefty gunslinger. I watched him last week in his first career start, right now with Carter Bradley uh, out. He made some incredible plays and throws. They just they couldn't put the ball in the end zone for whatever reason. Like, they were in that ball game with Troy. You're looking at a guy who took Troy right in that game. Just so pleasantly surprised when that fourth quarter rolled around and Troy all of a sudden put the hammer down on them. Kind of risky. But uh who is South Alabama playing this week? Oh, that's right. A wagon of a team. Oh. Coached by <laughs> none other than a stud that he is, Butch Jones. Alabama is playing Arkansas State. And this line is over 10. Is that 10 and a half? 11? 11 and a half? Well, wow. the line. What? You can get a 12 out there. Oh. Boy, if you're Arkansas that's so State. enticing. It's so enticing. Yeah, this Arkansas State team is playing really good football. And they have a chance to make a bowl game. After getting annihilated the first couple of games, Jalen Maynard comes in. Now, has Jalen Maynard come back to earth? Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. But they're winning ball games. That Louisiana defense is a good defense, and they put up 37. The only team that Jalen Rayner has looked legitimately like a freshman quarterback is against Troy. Yeah. And pretty much almost everyone has, right? But Gio Lopez looked good. Gio Lopez looked good against him, right? Colin Lacey, dude, he's a really good ball player. Now he had a gigantic drop in that, like late in that game that, you know, potentially would have given them a chance to score and – tie the ball game up in the fourth quarter. He's still a really good player. He's like, what, like second in the country in receiving yards? I mean, just a good ball player. They're well coached. They're at home, I believe. Uh, They're at home, right? Yes. So, I put this in mild. I put this in mild. Because I like because I liked what I saw from Gio Lopez. He's mobile, right? And, and of course, Webb is a great running back as well. They have a good ground game. They're pretty balanced attacking the ball offensively. And against bad defenses, South Alabama has made those defenses pay this year. Just as just as Southern Miss. They have made them pay. Uh, that's not to say I, they're on this list, though, because I like Arkansas State. I think if you're listening to the show long enough, I think you know that we like Arkansas State this year. We were on them way early. We were on them way early when Jalen ran, when the switch got made. So I, I do think this could happen. But I'm going to put it in mild. Would you agree on that? I would too. I, I do think, like, like you said, Jill Lopez, dog. We love that. I will say, like, a misconception in college football is like backup quarterbacks. If you're not like elite, 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 like, and yes, like 
Bradley's he's a stud, right? He he's a stud for for South Alabama and Sun Belt there. Like there is sometimes over adjustment on lines and like in Vegas, like you can find value in backup quarterbacks. Right. We've seen it time and time again. I do think at home he comes back home not facing a Troy defense. Like, like this is a nice I do think him lazy like they will get going with Darius Webb. Um yeah, I I, I think this and this game matters. Like if you say like it don't matter, like this game matters for both these fan bases, both these schools, like both these guys are trying to make a bowl game. Yeah, right? like fighting Arkansas for State. a bowl game. I, yeah, Arkansas State. When does this game goes to a bowl game, right? When when does this game becomes bowl eligible? Probably as, as South Alabama has Marshall. They both, but both they both play Marshall, so you you think you get a chance to get a win there. Um, but yeah, South Alabama is at four and five right now. They they need they need to win two more games, and they still have to finish the season at Texas State. So like, this is a huge mm-hmm. game for them, and I, I do think there's a reason they're twelve and a half point favorites or twelve point favorites, and like, I think it's gonna it's gonna pay out. I agree. Uh, last one. Let's talk Liberty, Liberty Baby. Um, uh, reason why I'm gonna put him in Steamy because Old Dominion is not terrible. They're feisty. And Liberty Liberty has not played a lot of not terrible this year. Jason Henderson, who we talked about earlier on the show. One man wrecking crew that is that linebacker at Old Dominion is a madman, right? Liberty is the number one rushing team in the country, right? If they can't run the ball, then what are they? Like, Ken Salton can throw the ball a little bit. I'm not going to say that he can't, right? But Jamie Chadwell wants to run the ball. If Jason Henderson and his wrecking crew at Old Dominion can get after that running rushing attack and he can have another game, there are 22 total tackles. Uh, I don't know. I th- this lines at what like thirteen and a half, and I think a lot of people expected that to be more. I just think Liberty has not had a lot, a lot of challenges this year. It's going to come somewhere. I think there's a really good chance that it comes this week. I just got I just got it. It's got a feeling, man. It's got a feeling. This is an awesome, by the way, out of conference game. Like, if you're not like like. I kind of was like, wait a minute, they're not in the same conference. Liberty's in the CUSA, Old Dominion's in the Sun Belt, right? Obviously, so it doesn't matter conference standing wise, but I, I know Ole Miss would love, would love to knock off Liberty. They're a feisty team. You do not blow this team out. You really don't. And like feisty games, like it, if you leave them in there, like I think Liberty, like you said, they haven't really been tested that much this year, right? Like if you get them in the corner, I, who knows what can happen in that game? I I do think this could be steaming, or, or it, can, it can be right there for for Liberty. I'm not going to put him on fraud alert. I'm not. I think I believe in Jamie Jadwell. Salters is done. I think has some great backs. Like this is a good roster, but I do think like the C, the CUSA is pretty bad. Their schedule's been even worse. I I think I don't think it's crazy to say that this might be one of the best teams they've played all year. Like four and five old dominion. Um, I think they might be, to be honest. Like this is a this is a really super intriguing game. Doesn't matter a ton, standing wise, we know that. But it's college football. Everything matters. These fan bases, these players, these coaches, it all matters, man. Like I know Liberty yeah. would love to go twelve and zero, and I know Old Dominion would love to get the bowl eligibility. All right, they're four and five. They're fighting for bowl eligibility. Like this game matters. Yeah. Old Dominion's losses, by the way. Lost to Virginia Tech week one of the season. A close loss to Wake Forest, where Wake Forest came back from behind, scored, outscored them twenty-seven to seven in the second half, right? And then they lost to a Marshall team. Marshall was terrible, by the way. They're terrible, but they didn't have, they didn't have Grant Wilson. They didn't have Grant Wilson that game. Yep. So and, she, and he she, that's she a big deal for, for ninety-five yards in that game and three picks, three picks in that game, uh, and they still almost won that game. James Madison, they came back in that game. And they had a chance to win that game. Coastal Carolina, they should not have blown that game. So, like, Old Dominion has been frisky in a lot of these games. They're pretty decent. If Grant Wilson or Grant Wilson can can play at that level, have one of his classic 109, a buck 90 and three touchdowns, right? And Jason Henderson can can make some stuff happen on defense. I think I think they could pull this off. Throw them there, right there, in steaming. 
So to recap, Liberty we have in steaming, Oklahoma we have in sweating, South Alabama we have in mild, and so same with Clemson, we have South Alabama a little bit more mild than, or sorry, a little bit, I guess a little hotter than Clemson, I guess. Uh, we, we think Clemson should get right here against Georgia Tech. Dawson's Diner, it's back once again. And you're looking at that record right now on YouTube at 24 and 26, and you're thinking, wow, this guy's a moron. Uh, I've been coming back. We've been on the climb. And once again, if you don't follow us on Twitter, all of these lines that are out right here, I gave out on Twitter on Monday. I gave all of them out. And they've all moved significantly. The first one, Troy minus 20. What's that one at? Minus 21 and a half. That's a key number. I'm sorry. If you're not following us on Twitter, if you're looking on YouTube, it's right down the screen at the Richard Soft. Uh, you're not going to get these lines uh, where we get them at. You're just not. UNLV minus lines move four, fast. Right? College football lines are moving faster and yeah. faster every year. UNLV minus four. That one's moved to five and a half. I would still take that. I would still take that up to six and a half. They play Wyoming at home. Wyoming is trending down. UNLV is still good. I like that one a lot. a and Mississippi State under 45. You can't get it at 45 anymore. Is that 43? Sorry, guys. I mean, follow us on Twitter. And follow us on Twitter, you'll get these lines. It's interesting because Max Johnson is looking like he's going to play, right? But how healthy is he? Like, How long is he going to last? How long is he going to last? Mississippi State also, is Will Rogers questionable? Someone told me that. I don't know. I haven't been that following would scare me, though. State That would football. scare me, though, because he, like, in his career, has had very much, very good success against a and Oh, yeah, yeah. But a different offense. You know, RIP Mike Leach. Wake Forest at NC State under 45. Uh, that one's moved to 43 and a half. Uh, MJ Morris no longer uh, playing for their team. He's redshirting rest of the year. Brandon Armstrong will be coming back. <laughs> Our guy. Uh, I don't hate under 43 and a half either. I liked it at 45. And again, if you follow us on Twitter, you can get it at 45. <laughs> when we get it. And the other one, uh, last pick, UCLA minus 16 and a half. That one's at 17. Still kind of like it. They play Arizona State. That Arizona State team is just massacred with injuries. Uh, UCLA wants a get-right game right here. They want a get-right game. It's coming. They might run the ball for 200 yards. Well, and and also you think about, like, in terms of preventing backdoor cover, like, they're going to be throwing the ball. They have to figure out their quarterback situation for their stretch run here. Like, they they got to figure that out. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. So that's it. Troy minus 20 against Lou Monroe. UNLV minus four. Texas A&M, Mississippi State under 45. Wake Forest, UNC State under 45. Uh, UCLA minus 16 and a half. And again, once again, all of those numbers have moved. How do you fix that? Follow us on Twitter at the Richard Saw. So thank you guys once again. That's the end of our Week 11 preview. Thank you guys for tuning in and letting us talk about these eight games with you. A little unorthodox. Some of these games unorthodox from what you guys are probably used to. But gosh darn it, we love covering that kind of football. Uh, so once again, we're over 100 subscribers. Can't thank you guys enough. Make sure to like the video. If you like the content, like the video, right? Subscribe uh, if you guys want to keep coming back for more stuff. We love giving this to you guys to you. Comment. Let us know what you guys want to hear. Uh, if you have any new segment ideas, uh, what, what teams are we missing, right? What do you want to hear us cover? agree disagree we, we love hearing all the feedback we can get we, you can also give us feedback at our email at the redshirt software gmail.com uh, twitter at the redshirt soft and the easiest way to do it is comment on these youtube videos so we appreciate you and we thank you so much cd you got anything you're gonna send us out with anything nope love the support from you guys thanks for watching till the end like you said do all the things he said because it helps our channel grow thank you guys you guys are the best, and we will see you in the next one.